Okay, so this is about starting a business, uh, and it's actually not, it's, it's, and it's not about just starting a business. It's more about like how does it work with like taxes and stuff like that relating to starting a business. And uh, um, yeah, we can just quickly introduce myself. I'm involved in a couple of different companies. I work with Venture Lab once one day a week uh, to help uh, with yeah students with ideas uh, moving forward. So if you book a meeting, you can book a me meeting with me, for example. Uh, I'm also been part of all of these different companies uh, and organizations and funding them uh, and founding them in one way or another. Uh, so I've seen a lot of different companies and I've seen uh, both companies in different fields. I've also seen uh, like associations. I've seen foundations and all of, all of those kind of things. And this is kind of condensed knowledge based on all of that. What works? What doesn't work? What is out there? What is not there? Uh, and this is done for the Swedish context. So it's about running an organization uh, from a legal perspective in Sweden. Um, yeah. And it, it will assume a couple of things. Uh, so it's it will, for example, assume that you're doing it in Sweden. It will assume that you can register a company in Sweden, which quite often requires you have a person number uh, or something like that. So some of the things they will assume, just because otherwise it gets super complicated and uh, we can't manage all of that uh, today, I'm afraid. But okay, so topics. Uh, the topics are these. Uh, so it's about um, uh, types of companies. What different types of companies can you start? It's about taxes and uh, so social taxes. It's about VAT, also a form of taxes. And it's about profit and how profit is taxed, which is relevant depending on how you uh, want to start your company what, and if it's, a, if it's even a company. OK, so uh, types of companies, yeah. So there are a couple of different ones. Uh, yeah, very mixed type of companies. Uh, there's Soul Trader in Swedish called Enskild Nærings Itgade, uh, also known in Swedish as Enmansbolag, Enskild Fødertag, like that. You have a limited liability company, which is um, Aksibolag. You have a trading partnership, Handelsbolag, limited partnership, which is called Kommanditbolag. You have economic association, an economic planning. And you have a non-profit association, which is called um, EDL for Learning. Then you also have gig companies, which I could talk a little bit more about. And also, you can ask yourself the questions, do you actually need a company, yes or no? But before we go into this, we just need to kind of make clear what's a legal entity. And this is something which just might be obvious for some of you, but for some of you, you don't really know this. And the different forms of organizations um, can be either a legal entity or not a legal entity. Uh, the difference here is that if there are a legal entity, then that organization is seen as a part from the legal system. So that means that that organization can, can um, uh, sign contracts, that organization can um, hire people and, and all those kind of things. So the organization itself is kind of a, a person, even if it isn't a person. And this is relevant because if a company, for example, is not a legal entity, then it's the people hiring other people or it's the people entering the contract. So you as a founder entering a contract with somebody. And it's a big difference from a legal perspective if it's you as a founder entering a contract or if it is uh, a company entering a contract which you are the owner or the founder of. That's a big difference from a legal perspective just because if, if you're sued, can they sue you or do they sue the company? If they sue the company, the company can become bankrupt. However, uh, that's a lot better than you becoming bankrupt. So like, where is there, a, is there a, a border between the company and you as owner or founder and stuff like that? So if a company or organization is a legal entity, there often is like a, 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 a safety net protecting you from the company uh, if it's something happens to the company in that sense. So it's good to know like that's what we mean with legal entity, that it's a, the organization itself can actually um, yeah, be, do legal things like being a part of a contract or hiring people stuff like that okay so what do we what do we want to talk about here so we start with the first one soul trader in the swedish which nobody says everybody says like or something like that um what's good with with if you want to start a company starting as a soul trader what's good with that it's simple and it's kind of free uh, some asterisks after those um, things, because there's of course some caveats. Uh, so it's it's simple in a sense that it takes maybe, if you know how to register, 
these kind of companies, it takes you five minutes and you register it. And if you don't know how to register these kind of companies, it takes you two hours, three hours, maybe, maybe to register it. Still relatively simple. Uh, can be done online. Uh, it's also free if you do it the correct way. Um, in Sweden, there's two, a, a, two uh, government um, agencies which uh, handle um, uh, company-related things. Uh, one is called uh, Bolagsverket, so the, yeah, the, the organization for companies, uh, which you would assume is relevant if you want to register a company. However, it's not relevant if you want to register a sole trader. Uh, because the other one is Skatteverk, the tax authorities. And the, the important thing when you register a sole trader is, is Skatteverk, the tax authorities. And registering it there is actually free. You can also register it at uh, Bolagsverket. But if you register it at Bolagsverket, it costs you 1,000 kroner. And all you actually register there is the name of your sole trading company. And registering a name for a sole trading company is quite useless because that name is only protected in the region you're in. So if you do it here in Skåne, you'll only protect your name in Skåne. So it's, it's super uh, uh, useless because in Sweden you also have uh, the way the the way the law works regarding uh, like branding and name is also that if you use a name, it actually is automatically protected. So like there's no real point in registering a name um, for your sole trading company. So it's one thousand kroner wasted if you if you do that. You can do it, but just not not, not worth it. But you need to register with the tax authorities because you need to have your uh, organization number. And if you starting a sole trader company, it's quite simple. Your organization number will be your per person number. So it's the same numbers. It will just be both. It will be both your per personal number and your organization number. So it's both. So sole trader, simple to get started. It doesn't cost, it's free or costs a thousand corner, relatively little money in, in the context. What's bad with it? It's not limited liability. So this means your sole trader is not a legal entity by itself. You are the company. So this kind of just gives you the per permit to kind of invoice people, to uh, hire people, and all those kind of things. But it's you as a person doing it. So there's no difference between the company and you as a person. Uh, so this is, can be relevant in some cases, but it's not really relevant if you want to grow the company in the long run. However, you can start like this and then transform it to other company types uh, later on if you want to. Mm -hmm. Then we have the limited liability company in Swedish called Axibolag uh, and often shortened AB. And if you actually start a limited liability company, you need to have the, either the word Axibolag or the letters AB in your name. You're not allowed to start it otherwise. So it's always very obvious from the name of the company if it's an Axibolag or not. What's a limited liability company? A limited liability company is a company which is owned by its shareholders. So the company is actually a, its own legal entity. It's something which exists by itself. And it's owned by those who own the shares. So when you start a limited liability company, you can, you can decide how many shares do I want to have in this company. And you can say, I want to have one share. Possible, very uncommon, but possible. Or you can have 100 shares, or you can have uh, uh, 10,000 shares, or something like that. It doesn't really matter. It's up to you to decide how many you want. And whoever owns the shares gets to decide who runs the company. It's quite common that you do this as one person. So that I am as a person, I start a limited liability company. To make it easy, I say that we have 10,000 10, shares. The shares, just to say, have it, but I own all of them. So it's totally my control, the company in that sense. And that's fairly, fairly common to have it that way. Or we could be two people starting together and we say, okay, you own 5,000, I own 5,000 of those shares. And then we have a 50, 50 say, and who runs the company in that sense. Uh, what's the point of all of this? The point of all of this is actually that uh, the shares are kind of a safety uh, measure to also make it clear who decides in the company, but also that you need to put in some money to register the company. So uh, until last year, it cost 50,000 kroner to register a limited liability company in Sweden. Now they changed it, so now it's only 25,000 kroner to register it. And why does it cost that, that money? Not, it's actually not a cost of registering it. It's a cost of you need to, have, you need to put that much money into the company in order to register it. 
And the reason is because of the limited liability. So that means that if, and as an external part, if I do business with the, the newly founded company, I know that there is at least 25,000 kroner of worth in that company. So if, so if we don't agree and I, I want compensation for something or I want to sue you, I know there is at least 25,000 kroner of kind of value, value in your company. So that's kind of a, uh, it makes me as an external part to the new company, um, like more, uh, uh, yeah, confident in doing business with it. But at the same time, that's also why there's separation of being a founder or owner and being the company, because the company has some means on itself. It can like do partnerships and stuff like that, because you can sue the company instead of needing to sue the owners uh, from this perspective. So that's kind of how, that's kind of the, the mechanism of how it works. Might sound a little bit complicated. It's not super complicated, but it's a mechanism which has been around for more than 100 years. So it's kind of it's a mechanism which is used all over the world, and it's not the most convenient, but it works, and people know how 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 the mechanisms work, which is an important thing for business perspective. Um, there's two type of limited liability companies: private ones and public ones. And uh, uh, public ones are a little bit more complicated, so we will not focus on those. Public with public ones. Uh, uh, Public li limited liability companies are, are companies which are traded on the stock exchange. So you can, you as, as a common person can buy shares in that company. There's more regulations if you do that. Um, it's not relevant unless you have a turnover of tens of billions at least, maybe hundreds, hundreds of millions of kroner. So it's not relevant when you, when you start a company. And initially, initially everything is private. It's a private limited liability company. And it will probably stay for that for the first 10 years of your business. So no, no worries about learning about the public versions um, yet. But so limited liability companies, good things, no personal liability. Uh, not really true. You can't do illegal things. So that means that if, I'm, if I have a business contract, I don't have a personal liability. But if my company um, uh, commits a crime against the environmental um, uh, law, for example, because I pollute the environment, I'm still responsible. So it doesn't protect against un unlawful things. It only protects against uh, like my like, like voluntarily business uh, contracts and stuff like that. Uh, and you can be a single person and have a limited liability company. That's also a good thing. Costs. That doesn't really cost, as I said, but you need to put in money into it. That money doesn't have to be money. It can be also, also things which are worth at least that much money. Uh, so if you have, for example, machinery, the machinery can be part of that, uh, for example. But usually nowadays, if you, because it's so low, it's 25,000 kroner, it's quite easy to just put in the money instead, and it's the easiest way of, of doing it. In other countries, might it might be very different. For example, in Germany, if you start a, a limited liability company there, Aktie Gesellschaft, it costs um, uh, 50,000 euro. Uh, uh, you need to put, it, put that in. So it's like it can vary a lot. But, but for example, in Britain, if you start a limited company, uh, then it's, uh, I think, one pound. So it's, it can be different in that sense. Uh, a question here. If you pay cash for the setup, is it possible to use the money within the company? Yes, it is possible to use the money. However, it's currently quite advised against it. Why? Because if you've spent more than half of your uh, uh, yeah, initial money to found the company, Axi Capital, uh, if you spend more than half, you need to do certain things in order not to become personal liable. Because that's kind of how the safety mechanism works. So, you, so as I am as, as an outsider to an Axi Bullard, if I want to do business with it, I need to know that there's money in that company. And, there, and therefore, there's a law which says, like, if you as an owner of the company spend more than half of your Axi capital, your uh, shareholding, share value, I don't really know what that's in English, sorry, of the initial money you put in usually. If you spend more than that, then um, uh, you will become personal liable unless you do something called control balance acting which kind of is a special, um, like special um, bookkeeping accounting thing you do in order to make sure that you can put back money later on. So for that reason, it's advised against spending that money. It's just so much simpler to assume you put that money in there, that money should be there, stay there. And if you one day um, uh, like don't want the company anymore and you um, liquidate it, as it's called, and then you get the money back. 
That's how you should see it. So you should, you should see it as money, which just sits there, even if it feels a little bit annoying, but try not to use it better. But if you really need to use it, you can, but definitely talk to somebody uh, who has been in those kind of situations before you do it. Exactly. So it's like a cash reserve for the company, kind of, but try not to use it. Uh, and if you need to use it, talk to somebody uh, if you don't feel confident or Google a lot and read about it. So it's possible, but not, not, uh, nothing, nothing you should do just uh, because there's money. Okay, good. Um, then we have Handelsblog, um, which is uh, yeah, uh, like a trading partnership. Uh, what's this? This is multiple people together starting a simpler company. Good thing, the same as with Soul Trader, it's free to register if you want to. What's bad? It's bad because you have a joint liability. So this is actually super bad from the perspective. If you have limited liability, you have less liability. In a trading partnership, you have joint liability. So that means that you and the other or two other people who you're starting this with are responsible for each other's actions, which is not a problem at all if everything is good, but can be a real big problem if things aren't good. Uh, so from that perspective, kind of bad uh, with a handles blog um, to have that. Um, we also have um, the Comalit blog, a limited partnership. Uh, even worse, uh, because it's an outdated mechanism. It exists and it is used in some very rare cases. For example, it can be used if uh, you're starting a law firm or things like that. But it's, in general, it's just, it's, it's, it, ex it still exists. There's still a lot of commandit blog who have been around for 50 years or so. So the legal framework needs to still, still be there. But if you want to start something today, you don't start a commandit blog. Like I, I, I've looked at numbers, how many companies are started in Sweden each year. And I think it was like a common blog was like less than 1% of all companies started in Sweden are common blog. Like you don't do it. Uh, and then we have other forms as well. So for example, you can start, instead of starting a company, you can start as an association. Why would you want to do that? Why wouldn't you, why would you not do it as a company? Well, you need to think that starting a company is no, is, is no means in itself. Like, like, why would you want to start a company? You want to start a company because you want to sell some products or you want to develop some products or some services or like you want to, you want to, you want to do something and the company is just a mechanism to do it. That's how you should see it. And that mechanism of doing things doesn't have to be a company. And an association and forening can also have those mechanisms. An association can have people hired, you can invoice, you can be VAT registered, all of those kind of things, which, which a company can do, can also be done by an association. So therefore, it's relevant to also have a look at those. And in Sweden, there's two types, economic association and uh, EDL, uh, uh, nonprofit organizations. Economic association, uh, good things with this, you need to put in money to start it, but you can decide how much money and you're only liable for the amount of money you put in. The uh, lowest amount to put in is one kroner, which I would say is probably quite common to do. So it can be kind of very cheap, almost free to start it and you have, this, and you have a limited liability uh, in, in effect, in essence. What's bad with it? Uh, it's bad that you have to be at least three people. You cannot start an association if you're less than three people. You need to be three people to have an organization. And uh, it's also bad that it is an organization. So that means that, it, for example, the organization's number will be a little bit different. You will see on, on organization's number that, it, that it's an, an organization instead of the, or an association instead of being a company. And also that some things are a little bit more complicated. For example, if you're dealing with the tax authority, authorities, if you start a company and then you say, I want to have the, my company VAT registered, which is super common, the tax authorities will just say, sure, of course, here you go. If you start an association and you say, I want my associations to be VAT registered, they will, they will ask you questions. Why? What kind of business are you planning to sell? Because it's not, it's not the standard, it's not default that an association has VAT registered. So it's, not, it's definitely not, pos not impossible to have it, but you just need to, you need to be prepared that you need to make a case that, yeah, but we are selling, we are having this association to sell these kind of products. Therefore, we need to be VAT registered. And then they will say, ah, oh, okay, good, and you are. But it will not be automatically happen. So that's something to keep in mind. 
Uh, so it might be a little bit more, uh, especially with the tax authorities, you might just need to, um, yeah, make clear to them that you're actually running kind of a business because that's what your plan is to do. And that's fine, you're definitely allowed to do it. It's just that it's not default. <laughs> Uh, and then we have a non-profit association. Uh, it's the same way. It's very similar to an economic uh, association. The difference is that an economic association's goal is to give its members profit. A non-profit organization's goal is something else. So that means that uh, you you can't make too much profit in a non-profit organization. You can still make profit. Um, the, the the general there's no rule it doesn't the, the law book doesn't say like ah this is the limit how much profit you can make uh, but the general consensus is that you shouldn't make more than ten percent of your um, turnover in profit and that's not seen as appropriate for a non-profit organization and this is something which might sound super super simple yeah but we don't want to make any profit but in practical terms it's something which is very hard to control because uh, you cannot really control your invoicing. When will you get your? When will you have your expenses and stuff like that? So it might it may very simply be that you just run your operations and then it just turns out like oh wait the last year we actually made a profit like it's it's more a bookkeeping thing profit than like an, a real that there actually is money in that sense. So it's, it might be easy to say ah oh, we don't make any profits, but you can actually because of bookkeeping making be, be making a profit. So things like that. But it's also it's definitely possible to run an organization uh, and a company as a non-profit organization. And social, yeah, the question here: What kind of um, category would social enterprises fall into? Um, social enterprises can be any of these. Uh, social enterprise is more about your um, uh, like your mentality and like how do you define yourself. There's, I've seen plenty of social um, uh, uh, enterprises which are actually blog. Uh, they can be a non-profit, they can be economic planning, um, I, they can be anything, all of these. Uh, some might benefit from being, for example, a non-profit organization or an uh, uh, economic association because they might, if you're, real, for example, are dependent on funding from other, from, from other funds or foundation, they might have rules we only fund uh, associations or we only fund uh, these kind of things so therefore it might be relevant but in practical terms it very seldom is relevant uh, so do whatever you feel is the most uh, convenient for you i would say uh, there's also when it comes to axiblog to limited liability companies there's actually a special case of limited liability companies as well which is a profit reduced limited liability company this is kind of the I, this was introduced kind of 10 years ago, I think. The idea is to actually be able to use the Axie blog, the limited liability framework, to have a social enterprise because this it uses the limited liability framework, but you're not allowed to make more than five or 10% profit, I think. Something like that, that is it. However, nobody's using it. Why? Because it's just a little bit worse than having a limited lim liability company. So therefore, it's just like nobody is requiring you to have these kind of companies. And then it's just easier and simpler to have it as a normal company, just because everybody knows how normal company works. But this um, profit uh, limited uh, company, is not, not everybody knows exactly what are the differences or not. So it's just, a, it's just harder and therefore nobody's using it because nobody's mandating that it needs to be used in that sense. Okay, uh, last thing, we also have a jig company. Uh, jig companies is when you are, yeah, you want to do maybe freelance work, but you don't want to start a company. Then you can go to other companies like Freelance Finance, Cool Company, uh, and others you've probably seen advertisement for. Uh, these are instead invoicing for you. So what you're doing is, in essence, you're using their organization's number to send the invoice, and then they pay you more or less a salary. So you, you actually don't even need to register a company. You're actually kind of employed by them, but uh, you have the freedom of deciding how much you want to invoice and how much you want to get paid. Uh, so in that essence, it's kind of simple, uh, and uh, you actually don't register a company. But as I said before, it's no, there is no point in registering a company to register a company. The point is in getting your business started or getting your business going. What's good with these? 
no need to register with the tax authorities. So that's easier, of course. Bad only really works if you're selling a service. If you're not selling a service, it doesn't really work. If you're selling, if you're starting an e-commerce store and you want to purchase products and then sell products, it doesn't work because then the, the, the tax laws are too complicated. So you can't do that through another company. Then you actually need to have your own company. Uh, so from that perspective, you need to kind of think if you're selling service or your time, it works. If you're selling something else or you're developing a product which you want to sell later or you want to, you want to patent things or stuff like that, it can't be done in this form uh, because then it will actually become the other company's uh, patents or the other company's products, stuff like that. Uh, okay, so I got a, got a more question regarding, I can get into that question soon, sorry. Okay, so do you need a company? No, um, you're actually allowed to uh, start to just do business in general. Uh, usually it's, uh, it's a limit of around 30,000 kroner. If you do more than that, you should have a company. Uh, but if, if you have less than 30,000 kroner in uh, turnover, you just don't, it's called hobby back summit. You just don't need it or ain't fellow talk. You don't need it um, in that sense. So you can just do what you want. It's also the way that if you register your company, you can actually use things you've done up to six months before and put it into your company. So my general advice is that if you want to start something, just start. Focus on, focus on the business side. And then you have six months until you actually need to order, get, get in the order, what kind of company is this? Is this an Axio blog or is it an Enquid Firma or something like that? So just start and then you can kind of correct the business side afterwards. If it goes too long, more than six months, then you need to stop and say, okay, wait, now we need to get the paperwork in order as well. But if you just want to try something, if you just want to get the first customer and sell something, just get the first customer, sell something, and then you can invoice that customer. Use your personal to in sense, put it on the invoice and just invoice the customer. The customer can pay, no problem at all. And then you can worry about what kind of company to start. So that's kind of good to have uh, to know. Also, if you, um, actually want to register a company and you're telling like when you register your company you kind of need to tell them your assumptions about the first year how much how much will your turnover will be how much profit will you make etc nobody knows that like you don't know how much turnover you will do the first year how how will you be able to know that however you need to apply with something and if you apply with too low numbers the tax authorities will actually get back to you and say like you don't need a company for this this is under 30,000 krona a year this is, you don't need to register. So we will, we will actually not allow you to register because you don't need to. Uh, so when you apply with the companies, you should actually like kind of make a first year which has a turnover at least like 50,000 kroner or something like that, um, even if that's not really true. And you can, as soon as you've got your company registered, you can always go back to the tax authorities and say like, oh, I changed my mind. We will actually have a turnover of zero this year. And they will just say, okay, thanks for, the, thanks for letting us know. So once you have it, you can change it however you want. It's, but, if, but before you have it, you cannot be too low. Okay, uh, so what do I recommend uh, here? Um, this is all my recommendations. You should start as a sole trader for getting started. I would recommend that more than actually starting with, with the, the jig company kind of business. Why? Because it will teach you to get into contact with the authorities. And sooner or later, you will want to have an Axi blog, a limited liability company. Like that's everybody ends up there. Whatever you do, sooner or later, it will be a limited liability company. Uh, and that requires a certain degree of contact with, with the authorities. And it's good to kind of have, a, have, have had a warm up by, do, by registering a sole trader. So therefore, I would say sole trader is a very good way of starting. Limited liability company, as I said, that's always where we really want to end up. If you're multiple people starting a company together, you should definitely not do Handelsbolag. You could have two options from my perspective. You should either do it as an economic association. Works fine. I've had friends starting, starting their companies as economic associations. No problem at all. And sooner or later, they change that to Laxi blog because everybody does that sooner or later. Or you should actually start as each person being a sole trader, and then you just have an agreement between yourselves. Like, okay, I'm sending the invoices, and then you send me half of the amount to my company, and I'll pay you. 
like, like it doesn't have to be more complicated like that, but it's a lot better if each of you have your own sole trading company instead of having something together, because that also it gives you a way of trying. Like, okay, do we actually need this? And uh, do, do we work together in a good way? Or maybe it's just a fun idea, but somebody doesn't like it in the long run and stuff like that. So do it as separate companies, but have a, a cooperation agreement between you, which can just be very simple, uh, like letter you, you write just to be clear, like, okay, this is how we want it to work. And then you just agree. This, you're totally f free to do those kind of agreements however you want to. And there was a question as well here about um, if it costs a thousand kroner to register in Quilt Firma. And no, not to the tax authorities. To Bolagsverket, it costs a thousand kroner. Tax authorities, free. Okay. Sorry, last time I checked, it was a couple of years ago now since I registered in Quilt Firma. So it might be that it's changed. But last time I did it, it was free to register in Quilt Firma. But it costs a thousand kroner to do it on Vaxam for the SA because then you also do it with Bolagsverket. But you can do it directly with Skatteverket uh, if you want to. Uh, and Quilfirma, what kind of bookkeeping is needed to be done? It's the same, the law is the same for all of these kind of different businesses. Bookkeeping requirements uh, uh, is uh, something you need, you need to fulfill. Um, it's relatively simple in the beginning. In the beginning, I would say you, you can use free bookkeeping software. You're actually not allowed to bookkeep in uh, like uh, Excel or Google spreadsheets. Uh, why not? Because one of the laws says that you need to be able to trace changes. So you can actually bookkeep on paper because there you can trace changes. You can, okay, somebody raised here and put another number. That's actually legal. But if you do it online and, or, or if you do it in a tool where you cannot trace changes, it's actually not uh, legal to have that as uh, bookkeeping. In, in the beginning, however, you will have so little revenue, so little turnover, and so little things to. Uh, to have in mind, so it doesn't really matter. But there are free uh, bookkeeping software out there, so I would just use uh, one of those. A little bit complicated, but in the beginning, nothing to worry about in that sense. Uh, is it a question regarding sole trader? Is it correct to assume that you can only be a sole trader for one company at a time? Yeah, you are the sole trader. There's like, it's no other, other, other choice. If the sole trader is just, you are the sole trader, and you can only be you. You cannot be two people, you're only you. So. Sole traders only, yes. Okay, so this was about um, uh, the different forms. Uh, yeah, and as I, as, as I uh, mentioned, you can do it initially without with, like without any relations to that company. Hope you found the talk. And, but okay, we want to talk more about other things as well. So taxes, we want to talk about taxes. This is super exciting, of course. Every, everybody loves taxes. Uh, and the initial thing we will talk about with taxes is uh, how does it work with like employee taxes? Like if I'm employed somewhere, like labor tax in that sense, how does it work? If I, I'm employed somewhere, I get paid, how does that work? And this is how people assume it works. I say it just to have it simply. I have my own Axi blog, my own company, and I'm actually and doing work through that company, but because the company is its own legal entity, I'm actually employed by my own company because that's how it works. It's my company, I own the company, I'm the managing director of the company, but I'm employed by my own company. Super normal, even if it sounds strange. My company doesn't work for another company, for somebody else, and I invoice them um, 10,000 kroner, excluding that, I'll come to that soon, 10,000 kroner uh, for this work. And then I want to pay myself for this. Okay, so I give myself a salary of 10,000 kroner, uh, and I need to, of course, pay taxes on that. Taxes in Sweden are roughly 30%. It's not really true. Taxes are actually extremely uh, detailed, uh, but you can call the tax authorities and just get, tell them, hi, I'm, I'm um, going to pay this much salary to this person with this person number. How much tax should I pay? And they'll tell you exactly. You should pay 1,589 kroner in taxes. Uh, or something. It will be an exact number, they will tell you. But if you want to generalize, it's roughly 30%. Because it's a, in Sweden, there's a progressive tax. So that means that if you actually earn a little money, you actually pay lower percentage tax. So if you, if you for example, own, if you, for example, would pay a salary of 5,000 kroner, your tax will only be 10%, not 30%. And if you have a really high salary, then you actually have a higher tax than 30%. But to make it easy to calculate in general, 30%, that's roughly where you end up. Um, and so then you have that. 
and you have uh, taxes you pay, and then you guys actually get 7,000 kroner out in that sense. Uh, however, this is not how it works because uh, it's, of course, more complicated. And uh, so what you have is that you have something called Arbeitsiva or um, social uh, social taxes, sometimes called. Uh, you have this in most countries, so it's not something particular for Sweden. It's just this different. How is it? How is it done? And how much is it and stuff like that? So this means that actually, if I have a revenue of ten thousand kroner and I want to pay all of that money to an employee or to myself, I actually need to calculate backwards because. Albert Siva of is 31.42% on the salary. So that means that if I would pay myself 10,000 kroner in salary, I would need to pay 3,000 kroner on top of that in social taxes. But I don't have 3,000 kroner on top of that because I only got 10,000 kroner. So I need to calculate backwards. And if I calculate backwards, I'll see, okay, if I pay myself 7,500 kroner, then those 30% are roughly 2,500 kroner. That makes 10,000 kroner together. And then, and then my taxes are de de deduced from my 7,500 kroner salary, and I actually get 5,000 kroner out. And this is important to know because you need to know that from a company perspective, what's relevant is actually not the salary, it's actually the cost of labor, which is the salary plus social taxes. That's the cost of labor. And for the employee, it's actually not relevant what the salary is. It's relevant how much money do you actually get. And that's the salary minus the taxes. So actually, the salary number itself is super irrelevant, but it's used as a basis for the calculation. So therefore, it's any relevant. But you kind of need to understand that. And uh, also, a general rule, as you see, 10,000 kroner revenue, 5,000 kroner paid out. Also, that's kind of how it ends up. Like, if whatever you do, always assume half of it goes to the tax, tax authorities. That's the, the rules are made in a way so that it kind of is there where you end up. It might be a little bit less sometimes, 45%, might be a little bit higher sometimes, 55%. But if you just want to make like quick calculations, 50%. Assume 50% and you will not be too far off. So that's something important to have, to have in mind. <clears throat> Why do you want to have a company then? Ah, there's one thing which happens if you have a company which you can't do if you're only employed, uh, which is one of the reasons also, for example, for what I'm saying is be better to register a sole trader than register a gig company because if a gig company, you're really only employed. And that is a company can decide what to do with its money before it pays out salary and therefore taxes. And this means that if I have my own Axibolog, uh, and I do this uh, job for somebody else, I invoice them 10,000 kroner, but I need a new computer. Then I have two options. Either I pay for my computer as a private person with the 5,000 kroner, with the 5,000 kroner I've left from paying myself a salary for the, for the job, or I buy the computer with the company. Can I buy a computer with a company? Yes, if it's relevant for your work, you can do the purchases with the company. If it's not relevant for your work, you cannot do it. So you cannot buy a bed for yourself with the company money unless you run a hotel. Then you can buy a bed. And it's actually as simple as that. If you can prove that you need it, if somebody knocks on, if the tax authorities knock on your door and say like, hi, this purchase here, can you prove that you're using it in, uh, in business? Then yes, then you can deduct it. But if you're like, um, I need to sleep, otherwise I can't work. Then they will say like, sorry, sleeping is not uh, the, the role of the company to provide for you. you need, that's the role of you as a private, private citizen. So you cannot deduct your bed, sorry for that. And you need to pay uh, taxes and some uh, penalty fees. So, you don't, so don't do that. However, computer is a super good example because almost any business can use computer, but can be other things as well as, as, as long as it's relevant. So what happens? You do your revenue of 10,000 kroner, you purchase your computer, for 6,000 kroner, excluding VAT. Then you have 4,000 kroner left. That amount you can still pay a salary, but you can't pay 4,000 kroner salary because then you have the social taxes, so you need to do the backwards calculations. If you pay 3,000 kroner in salary, then you have roughly 1,000 kroner in social taxes, so that's 4,000 kroner together. So then you spend 10,000 kroner. Salary is 3,000. Taxes on the 3,000 is 1,000 kroner, so you get out 2,000 kroner in hand. So that means that for those 10,000 kroner, you actually got a computer worth 6,000 kroner and 2,000 kroner in cash. 
this is something you cannot do if you're doing the gig economy way or if you're just employed because you cannot choose to buy the things with a company before paying taxes. You need to pay the taxes first and then you can purchase things. So this is a benefit of, of having and running a company in those senses. Okay, what's important with taxes and, and social taxes? In order for your company to actually do this, you need to apply to Arbeitsgeberwerket. This is not relevant if you're a sole trader, because if you're a sole trader, you and the company are the same thing, so you're actually not employed by your company. You can, however, still purchase a computer, and it still works in the same way, but you're not officially employed by your company. But, how, but if you have an economic foreigning, or if you have Axibolog, you are employed by your company. And in order for a company to have employees, it needs to be registered with Arbeitsgeber listed, which you do at Skatterwerket. So it's just something to keep in mind that you need to actually be a registered asset. As soon as you are registered in Arbeitsgeber, you need to each month tell Skatterwerket how much money you paid, you paid your employees, which might be only you. Important, if you don't do that, they'll fine you um, 500 kroner because you're late uh, with your numbers. Also important that you need to do this uh, regardless if you actually paid salary or not. Skatterwerket, the tax authorities, do not know how much money you will pay. That's why they put it on you as a company owner to, to report it to them. You need to tell them how much money you paid. They will not know that otherwise. But that also means that they will not know if you have planned to pay zero salary this month because they will not know. You need to tell them zero. So you need to tell them each month how much salary you paid. There's no law in Sweden which actually limits salary in any way. So that means that you can pay how little salary you want, you can pay how much salary you want, you can pay salary one month and not the next month, you can pay salary five times in one month. You can do however you want with salary. There's actually no, no, nothing which prohibits you in one way or another. If you become bigger, you usually and have multiple employees, you, you like 10 or maybe 20 or 50 employees, then you might be. Um, uh, uh, connected to, to a union and then the union might have requirements you should pay this much salary you should the salary should be paid on the 25 each month etc but from a law perspective you're totally free to do how you want to there's no minimum salary either you can pay a person one kroner for working a full month it's totally legal not it's not against the law uh, in any way uh, so you're very free in that perspective however there's a lot of um, kind of assumptions and there's a lot of things you and the employee agree on. So for example, the employee might say, yeah, but I don't want to work for one kroner. Yeah, doesn't help then if, if you can only pay one kroner if you can't find somebody to do the work for you. And the employee might say, I want the same salary each month because that's kind of what I'm expecting. Yeah, okay. So then you might actually need to pay on the same salary each month and they might also want to have it on the same day each month. So of course, if you have employees, the usual thing is that they have the same salary and you said that you pay it monthly. But Actually, you're totally free to do what you want to. Um, uh, what's more important? Doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, exactly. Those are the important things. A question regarding what you can deduct, what kind of purchases you can do with your company. Uh, is there anything, phones here, what can you purchase? Phones, computers, uh, which is always possible to, to deduct. I would say in general nowadays, phones, computers uh, are definitely uh, all, always relevant. Uh, the same, I would say, is office space. If you're renting office somewhere, that's also always uh, relevant. Uh, however, much more than that might be hard. Of course, like um, paper and uh, like uh, a printer and stuff like 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 things related related to the computer or to kind of needing to do work is also something which is relevant. But for example, um, camera might not be. But if you're doing photography, of course, a camera is relevant. Um, expensive software relevant. If you need it, if you not, you need it, not re not relevant. So it definitely totally depends on what kind of business you do. Okay, we also want to talk about VAT. We're starting to run out of time, but we'll as quickly. Uh, and we have VAT and profit tax left. Might be that we run ten minutes over time or so, just so that you know. Uh, VAT is in three different batches: twenty-five percent, twelve percent, and six percent. And this is for different products. Actually, not really true. VAT is a four. It's 25, 12, 6, and 0, which we talked about briefly. And standard is 25. So if you don't know, it's 25%. If you don't know and you want to make sure, you call the tax authorities or you Google, and it will tell you somewhere how much it is. They're, they're quite clear on what, where is the limit. 
12% food, restaurants, those kind of things. 6% transport, uh, if you're a person, uh, for example. Also books, culture is 6%. There are some gray zones. Uh, so for example, uh, concert tickets uh, is that 6% or 25%. Depends on what kind of concert and who's doing it. So if you're doing something which you think is food or transport or something like that, and then uh, and you're not really sure, Google it or ask them, and they'll tell you uh, how, how it works. There's also 0%, which is office space, for example. Uh, super complicated. Avoid it at all costs if you can. Why? Because for some reason, the, the uh, bookkeeping becomes really relevant as soon as you move to zero VAT. So if you have zero VAT, you need to separate all your purchases which are relevant for that branch of the business versus all of the other purchases. And it just becomes a, a bookkeeping nightmare. Uh, so everybody tries to avoid zero uh, VAT if they can. Uh, if you're unlucky, for example, if you're starting, if you're a musician and doing freelance work, uh, you have zero VAT, uh, then you need to read up on that just to make sure that you don't do it wrong in one thing. But, if, but on the other, if it's 6, 12, or 25, it actually doesn't matter. Uh, there's no special regulations. It's only when it becomes zero with the special regulations. So beware of zero. That's good to know. So how does it work? VAT is actually in two ways. The VAT is a value-added tax. So it's a tax put on top of a product or service. The idea is that the end consumer is paying it. That's kind of the idea. So the, the final consumer of the service or of the product is the one paying the VAT. However, it's put on all products. But if you're not the end consumer, you can deduct it. So if you're not the end consumer, you get the money back from the government. But you still need to pay the VAT to whoever you purchased the product or service from. And this becomes bookkeeping-wise a little bit complicated. So VAT is one of the main reasons why you actually want to keep track of your bookkeeping because you need to know how much have, have you purchased and what VAT have you paid on those purchases and how much have you invoiced or sold and how much VAT have you gotten paid. So the difference between those is what you either pay to the government or if you're having more expensive than you have income, you actually get money back from the government. But it's important to, to keep track of this. So please keep track of this and uh, because uh, that's, this, is, this is where it becomes uh, complicated or uh, frustrating after like if you haven't if you don't keep track of it and try to like ah oh, what did I purchase last February and like you you won't remember and then you will just become a mess and it's super super messy to clean up so yeah uh, uh, when you, a question here when working as a freelancer for companies outside Sweden is it correct to not charge VIT. As soon as you do, VAT becomes com VAT is a little bit complicated within Sweden, but if you understand, okay, it's how much VAT I charge and how much I pay, and I just deduct those from each other, and the difference is what I pay to the government if you have a profitable business. That kind of, once you understand that, it's kind of easy. As soon as it's outside Sweden, it becomes more complicated. Why? Because we have outside Sweden EU and outside Sweden non EU, different rules. And we have outside Sweden product, outside Sweden service, different rules. So it depends on if it's a product or if it's a service, if it's within EU or outside EU. So as soon as you're selling something outside Sweden, call the tax authorities or Google it, and it will tell you how to do it. If it's within, within EU, then it might be without VAT if it's a product, but it might be with VAT if it's a service, etc. So Google it, and it'll let you know. The simplest way of finding and doing it correctly. Uh, because there's so many layers of it, so it depends uh, on what you need to do with the sale. Might also be some. Sometimes there are also a trade agreements agreements between countries, so it might actually be different if it's Norway versus if it's China. Might be different rules, even if the, even if both are outside the EU. So ask or Google. Uh, the company is not an end. The company is never the end consumer because the idea is that the company is doing something with whatever it purchases and selling it for further that's the basic idea so the company is never the end consumer so therefore all vat you pay with the company you will be able to get back from the government however you usually uh, get more vat back from your consumers instead your customers uh, and therefore the net is actually that you still need to pay the government but only the difference which is can be quite low in that sense. Uh, but the, the, you as a company, you are never the end consumer. 
exceptions, of course. If you are VAT registered, then you're an FDN consumer. That's the point of when you have a company, you want to VAT register the company. If you have an association, you want to VAT register to association. If you're not VAT registered, then you are the end consumer. But that's uncommon. So usually you are VAT registered with your organization, either association or company, and then you are never the end consumer. That's how it works. VAT is paid and reported either yearly, quarterly, or monthly. And what's best here depends on what you want to do. Uh, I would, I'm, I'm, this is often dependent on how many transactions your company is doing. You're a freelancer. You invoice uh, twice a month and you do two or three purchases a month, yearly VAT. Um, you're a freelancer, but you have quite a good business. So you actually invoice 10 to 15 times a month and you actually have some subcontractors which invoice you twice or four times a month, mm, quarterly. Uh, you open a cafe and you have customers each day which pay you for uh, your coffee uh, and you purchase things from the bakery daily or weekly and you purchase things from the other uh, grocery store uh, weekly, monthly VAT. So what does this mean? It means the more transactions you have, the more often you want to both report and pay your VAT. Why? Because if you're having daily transactions, multiple daily transactions, and you register it yearly, it will be so messy if, some, if you don't have all, all of the um, receipts and all of those kind of things. So the more transactions you have, the more often. A good, uh, like a, a good VAT report is maybe... 20 to 100 uh, transactions, that's manageable. As soon as it's more like than 100 transactions, it's so easy that one or two of them are messed up and then everything is messed up. So uh, find an appropriate way, usually when you start yearly or quarterly, is, is from my perspective recommended. It's bad to have a tool to uh, sell them as well because one important thing with VAT is it's not your money. So if you have a yearly VAT, for example, it, and you have a, a business which does a profit, then you actually own the government quite a lot of money by the year's end. But if you're not on track with your bookkeeping all the way, you might be fooled by your bank account. You might look at your bank account and be like, whoa, I have 100,000 kroner. Yeah, but 60,000 of them are the government's money in VAT, which you own the government. You just don't know it yet because you haven't realized that you need to do your VAT reporting only, only once a year, so you first do it in February. So uh, doing it to sell them can have the bad effect of actually spending more money than you have. Super bad. Never spend the government's money. Always, uh, the government always gets angry on that. So, uh, be, so that's also one of the reasons to actually have it quite often, because then you, then you know better out, right? Yes, I don't have that much money. It is, I've been in that position myself multiple times. It's so easy to get fooled. Like you look at the bank account like, oh yeah, business is going good, I have this money. And then you're like, oh yeah, okay. Actually 50,000 kroner and um, I need to pay the taxes for it next month. Hmm. And it kind of sucks if you have 50,000 kroner to pay the taxes for it next month and you don't have the money. Super bad position to be in. Okay, last point. Uh, profit, how does profit work in companies? Uh, so we pa we've talked about um, paying your employees, which can be yourself. That's one way to actually, for a company to pay money to individuals. There's another way for a company to pay money to individuals, and that's through profit. By the end of the year, the company, if it has more uh, revenue than costs, has, makes a profit. How does that work? Two examples here, which is just to keep it kind of simple because it's the most relevant. Sole trader. Sole trader example is rather simple. The profit you make at the end of the year is regarded as uh, you as salary. It's super simple, actually, in that sense. So it's more or less like whatever whatever uh, profit you made, it's salary. It will be taxed as salary. It won't be called Albesiwaif. It will be called Eganwaif, but it's ex worth in, in exactly the same way, and um, you get some money. Chick. So actually, rather simple. If you have a limited liability company. You can do more things and their profit is actually two different layers of taxes one is that when you make your profit you actually um, pay uh, company tax on that profit and this is when you read in articles about like oh company taxes are so high or so low whatever this is a company tax we're talking about so the money you make at the end of your financial year will have taxed 
from in Swedish called bolagsskatt, so corporate tax in English, and in Sweden it's 22%. That's how much it will be taxed. So then, if you want to pay out your profit to your shareholders, which might be only you, you have another tax because making a profit on shares is something else. And so then you have a 30% tax of that. So it doesn't matter that, you, that, that the shares are your own companies. Make you make profit, you own shares, and those shares make a profit, you're taxed for that profit. And so that means that if I have a, a limited liability company and I make a profit of 30,000 kroner a year, it will be taxed with Bullock Scat, with corporate tax, 6,600 kroner, leaving 23,400 kroner in profit after taxes. Uh, and if I want to do pay that to me, to, to the owners, to myself, as dividends, I need to pay 30% tax on that, which means that I get out 16,000 kroner. And again, 30,000 becomes 16,000 kroner. Kind of 50% disappears. Why? Because they don't want to make it to be a difference between paying taxes as salary and paying taxes as a shareholder, because they want to, um, it doesn't, shouldn't matter. You shouldn't optimize to one way or another. It should be kind of the same in that sense. That's why, why that's so, so similar. But as you see also, it's a little bit better than with a sole trader. You actually get a little bit more money out of that. Uh, so that could be relevant uh, to have in mind as well. Uh, also, difference between limited liability company and sole trader, you don't need to pay the dividends. You can actually choose with your profit off the taxes, your 23,400 kroner, to keep it in the company. And if, for example, next year is the worst year and you don't, uh, and you actually make a loss, you actually don't need to pay the taxes on the dividends. So you actually can save on taxes if it's different between the different years. If you make profit sometimes, loss sometimes. If you're a sole trader, you don't have the options. The profit you make will be salary for you, no matter how next year will be or not. Uh, currently, there are actually some exceptions to that, but we won't go into that as currently special corona rules. And uh, there's also something called the tre tolbregel, which actually means that if your profit is lower than 200,000 kroner from your, from your limited liability company, your taxes are actually not 30% incomes of capital, but 20%. This is a rule uh, which is put into place because the government wants to promote uh, smaller businesses. They say like, okay, but you as a, sm as a small business owner, you actually... Uh, take a lot of risk, you spend a lot of your time on this, so we understand that you might might not want to pay as high taxes. So we have made this rule, Tretolbregel, it's called, which is that you actually get 10% less taxes on a, a, a certain amount of your profit, which is, I think currently the limit is 280,000 kroner in profit or so, you actually pay less taxes. If you do oh, if you do profit in your limited liability company, you will most likely have somebody who helps you with your bookkeeping just because they would generally recommend it, doesn't cost so much. They will tell you this. Ah, yeah, I know this is how much you should pay. So like it, it's you you will not do that this wrong too much, I think. <clears throat> okay, question on this. Um, is this only with cash or do you need to pay tax if you pay off a loan with a profit? Ah, uh, ooh, loan. Interesting things here. So, how is your profit uh, calculated? Your cal cal profit is calculated by looking at your income and your costs. Loans are not a cost. Interest on loans, that's a cost. Paying back a loan, not a cost. So that means you can actually end up in quite weird situations where if you have a loan, you actually don't have any money because you've paid back the loan, but paying back the loan is not a cost. So you're still making a profit and you still need to pay uh, corporate tax because your company still makes a profit. So if you have loan in, in uh, if you're taking a loan to your company, uh, I will just in general advise, use a bookkeeper and they'll keep track of this uh, so that you don't make it wrong. But paying, paying interest is a cost, paying back on a loan is not a cost. Don't ask me why, I didn't make the rules, but important to remember. Okay, good. Last things, important notes, just in general, what to think about it with these kind of rules. Uh, it's this is Sweden. You can talk to Skatteverk. Skatteverk is actually one of the uh, authorities which has the highest um, um, ratings among uh, uh, of service in Sweden. A lot of like as a company owner, Skatteverk is just awesome. I would say you can ask them, you can call them. They have super much information on their website. They really try to make it simple for you to do the right thing. So like they're good. I must say, so call them, 
have, if you're uncertain anything, call them. If you get an answer you don't really feel uh, confident about, call them again. There are so many employees, you'll talk to somebody, somebody else. If that person gives you the same answer, then that's probably the way to do it. If that person gives you another answer, then you also might know that, okay, it's not even, it's not even clear for them because they don't know everything. So, for example, one of the companies I started, Contento, we had uh, uh, freelancers, or we had employees, not freelancers, we had employees working all over the world and still have that a lot, uh, and earning salary. And suddenly it's like, hmm, how do we pay taxes? So we have a Norwegian guy sitting in Vietnam writing uh, texts for us, a Swedish company, but it's ordered by a German uh, customer. Where does that person pay taxes? Yeah, if you ask that question to Skatevac, it they don't even know. So, like, sometimes it becomes complicated. But usually, if it's it's simpler things, they'll tell you right away. And as I said, if you feel it's complicated, then ask multiple times, and then you can see, okay, is it kind of aligning the answers or not? And in worst case, you actually should um, talk to a, a lawyer, a tax lawyer, uh, because they will tell you, okay. This is how it's usually done in these cases. But even they don't always know. So yeah, but as Scatterbucket. However, Scatterbucket assumes you know what you're doing. That doesn't mean that you can't ask them, but it means that if you don't ask them, or especially if you just do your operations, your daily operations, they will assume you know when to pay your taxes. They will assume uh, you know how, to, how bookkeeping works, etc. And if you don't pay your taxes on time, they'll fine you because it's your responsibility as a company to know where to pay taxes. So this is the difference between how they behave towards you as a private person. In Sweden, Skatevacket behaves very, uh, like they, they kind of takes the responsibility for you as a private person. They tell you, this is how much tax you're going to pay just so that you know it, etc. As a company, you need to tell them, yeah, yeah, I've done all these things, this is how much tax I will pay. And if you don't tell them on time, they will find you. And if you tell them, if you tell them something and then it turns out that was wrong, they might find you. So things like that. If you do wrong, if you tell them the wrong things, it can be fixed. So you report your taxes, your VAT report, for example, and you missed something. You can fix it. If you're late, you will get uh, fined. Uh, initially 500 kroner, then it's 1,000 kroner, then it's 2,000 kroner, then it's 4,000 kroner. It becomes expensive if, you're done, uh, if you do it once, no problem. If you if you're generally are late with your payments or your reporting, it will become expensive. Don't be generally late with your reporting or, or payments. And you can actually persuade them not to fine you uh, if you have a good argument. If you're saying, ah, sorry, I, I realized we messed up here and we've done these precautions not to, for it to not happen again. That's what they're interested in about here. They're not interested in about here why it went wrong. They're interested about here why will it not happen again. Then you might actually get out of paying uh, the fines, uh, but only once or twice, not, in the, not always. If you do wrong, and it, but you did it wrong in a way which made it that you paid too much tax, that's never a problem. You just, you, you ask, you, not, not never, but almost never a problem. You tell them, sorry, I reported wrong, I, I got the number wrong here, or I missed this, uh, it shouldn't have been this much, uh, I paid you too much. Uh, sorry for that. And then you will just put that money back to your um, account, your SCATA account, at which you need to put back to your bank account yourself. Um, if you do wrong, and you pay too little tax, they might ask you questions. Ah, why didn't you know about this? Uh, on all those kind of things. If it's a thousand kroner, two thousand kroner, they will sell them worry. If it's a hundred thousand kroner, mm, they will ask you questions. And they might also find you somewhat and also put on interest. Ah, you didn't pay it, you reported back then, but it should have been this much, we'll put interest on that. So it will be more expensive. And you also need to know tax crimes are serious crimes. What does that mean? That means that uh, uh, don't do it. <laughs> That's it. Why? It's that way because from a government point of view, it's actually very, it's almost worse from a government point of view if you mistreat the government than if you mistreat another person. So most laws, most crimes are between individuals. Like I, I shouldn't kill somebody. Okay, I shouldn't steal from somebody. Okay. But actually, the government doesn't care too much if, if I do bad things to other per people. The government cares a lot if I do bad things to the government. And not paying taxes is stealing from the government. So therefore, stealing from the government, a lot harsher crime than stealing from somebody else because it doesn't really affect the government. So that's, that's how the government thinks. So you need to kind of figure that out. Right? Okay, tax crimes, it's kind of serious crimes. 
avoid it, even if it might seem like, oh, it's not so much money. <clears throat> OK, good. With this, I'm kind of wrapping up. We've talked about these things as well. Organizer host number is the organization number. You can incorporate things month retroactively. You have SNE numbers, SNE numbers. You need to add, you need to, when you register your company, you need to tell them which kind of SNE number it is. Almost never relevant, except during Corona times, kind of. Uh, uh, but you know, it's just need to choose kind of what area your business is in. When you do that, you will find out that there's kind of never a perfect SNE number. So choose what's kind of close to what you're doing. There's, there's like thousands of SNE number, but ne never is the right one for you, just so that you know. Uh, and then we've talked about FSCAT, which is uh, uh, having the FSCAT is the Swedish name for having being VAT registered, so that you can you can send a furlough tax cat. You, you you have a company which is thus furlough tax. There's also something called FRSCAT that's kind of important to know about as well. If OSCAT is only relevant if you're a sole trader and you both want to invoice and work for another company at the same time. Not study, study doesn't count, but if you both pay labor tax because somebody else employs you and you invoice people and you pay uh, VAT, et cetera, then you need to be, again, then you need to register for FRSCAT instead of for FSCAT. So if that's the case, do that and just read up on that. But otherwise, it's always FSCAT, which is relevant. Good. We're over time, so we'll actually wrap it up there. Uh, in the chat, there's a link to a, to a webinar. So please uh, follow that and just give us a very short uh, um, yeah, a review about what you thought about this lecture, because we use that to evaluate how we, how we presume it in the future. Um, was one more question? Just asking here to see if I can answer that as well. Just to confirm, is it possible to start e-commerce without registering to the scatterbacket as long as it doesn't pass the 30,000 30, kroner limit? Uh, yes, it's definitely, you, can, you can start your e-commerce company without registering uh, at scatterbacket. You need to later put in how much you sold and how much on your purchases in your own personal um, declaration. Uh, so you will tell you will tell them next year how you did it. But you can start it without registering a company, and if you get traction, which we hope, then you should um, uh, uh, register a sole trader initially. I would say, uh, in that sense. Um, also, if you didn't know about it, we have the e-commerce park of Sweden. So if you have any questions regarding this with e-commerce e and stuff like that, email me, and I'll put you into contact uh, so that we can do that. Uh, or email them, ecommercepark.se. Email them and just say, hi, you're part of Venture Lab. They do quite a lot with Venture Lab. So, hi, you're part of Venture Lab. I would love to uh, uh, know more. I can put it there. Good. OK. Thank you. Thank you for listening and being here. And uh, fill in the evaluation. And uh, take care and good luck with your business. Bye.